Once all wheels are on the ground, maintain positive pressure on the control yoke and smooth braking may be applied if necessary. Maintaining control pressure and any crosswind correction is critical for the proper directional control. Remember to keep flying the aircraft even after it has made contact with the runway. The duty to fly the aircraft is not complete until that aircraft is parked and secured. Before accomplishing a normal approach and landing, it is important to reference notes found in the appropriate POH. Cessna emphasizes a few key steps in their description of normal landings for the Cessna 172S. According to the Cessna POH, normal landing approaches can be made with power on or power off with any flap setting within the flap airspeed limits. Landing at slower speeds will result in shorter landing distances and minimum wear to tires and brakes. Power must be at idle as the main wheels touch the ground. The main wheels must touch the ground before the nose wheel. The nose wheel must be lowered to the runway carefully after the speed has diminished to avoid unnecessary nose gear loads. Now that the premise of the normal landing has been established, the standards to which a pilot must demonstrate are found in the appropriate PTS. These standards focus on safety and very little between private pilots and commercial pilots. Pilots meeting the PTS standards exhibit knowledge of elements related to a normal and crosswind approach and landing. They consider the wind conditions, landing surface, obstructions, and select a suitable touchdown point. They maintain a stabilized approach and recommended airspeed with wind gust factor applied. They apply smooth, timely, and correct control applications during the roundout and touch down as the aircraft touches down smoothly at approximate stalling speed. They guide the aircraft to a touchdown at or within a specified distance beyond a specified point with no drift and with the airplane's longitudinal axis aligned with and over the center of the runway. They maintain crosswind correction and directional control throughout the approach and landing sequence. They complete the appropriate checklists. Private pilots must maintain the recommended airspeed within plus 10 and minus 5 knots. This large window, however, is not recommended by Cessna or UND standardization. Commercial pilots are required to maintain plus 5 and minus 5 knots. At UND Aerospace, private and commercial pilot applicants are expected to maintain plus 5 and minus 0 knots of the appropriate final speed considering gust factor in the Cessna 172. The touchdown for private pilots must be at or within 400 feet beyond a specified point. Commercial pilots must touch down at or within 200 feet. With practice, the pilot should be able to determine the touchdown point based upon the aim point selected, which will yield greater accuracy. The normal approach and landing procedures instill confidence and consistency in performing landings. It is not just the rote memorization of numbers, however, that make a good landing. From this procedure, the pilot should develop the ability to continually reference the aiming point during the landing phase. This skill will yield greater control, accuracy, and consistency in determining touchdown points for any type of landing on any type of field from any type of approach, power on, power off, and over obstacles. Once a pilot is comfortable with using visual glide path indicators, practice should enable a pilot to recognize a three degree glide path without these references. Visual references such as the Pappy and Bazzi are not the only markings a pilot can use to determine glide path. Another reference that is not as utilized is the runway numbers themselves. The numbers will generally not be the aiming point for a normal landing, but if they are legible, the pilot is close to the proper glide path. If they look tall, the pilot is too high. If they appear squished, the pilot is too low. This normal approach will be a power on approach. Smooth adjustments with slight control pressures will be required throughout. If aggressive adjustments are required, the pilot must question whether or not the approach really is stable. While the actual power setting will vary based on weight and balance, density altitude, 
and a plethora of other factors, a significant reduction in power is required at the abeam point. Remember, this really is supposed to look like a rectangular traffic pattern. Use those ground reference techniques, and don't forget, the aircraft is capable of safely banking up to 30 degrees in the traffic pattern. There will be days when you may have to use all of it. Stay focused, stay coordinated, and stay safe. Sometimes, in the course of navigating busy airports and airspace, it is necessary to extend or modify various legs of the pattern. The pilot should develop a sense of timing for when to make proper power, configuration, and airspeed changes based on the ideal pattern. Although the pattern itself may change due to ATC requests such as extend downwind or I will call your base, it is much easier and stabilized to maintain the ideal timing. To do this, the pilot must learn to visualize and estimate distance from the aiming point. For an extreme example, consider a 3-mile straight-in approach to 3-5 left. Even though the aircraft is